Hello and welcome back to my third and final video about Titian's Diana and Callisto in which I will be discussing how the lives of these paintings and the people that owned them were often just as interesting as the stories going on within them. So if you've watched my previous videos, you will know that this work, along with Diana and Actian and a rather lovely Murano glass vase, was sent to Philip II in 1559. Titian was quite rightly really proud of his Diana paintings and he wrote to Philip II that he was sorry that they had taken three years to complete but that he had wanted to make them constantly even more exquisite so that they would be worthy of such an illustrious patron. So it's clear that Titian created Diana and Actian and Diana and Callisto together alongside each other in his studio and it's very likely that he intended them to hang together as well. If you notice there's a stream in Diana and Actian and if you put it alongside Diana and Callisto that stream then flows from one painting right into the next. The same with the mountains at the, the back of the works, probably by the way the, the Dolomites just north of where Titian lived in Venice. And there's one other aspect that I just want to draw your attention to and that is Actian's hunting dog who then also appears in Diana and Callisto. So Diana has stolen his dog after this dog has ripped poor Actian apart. Oh, I don't think that's a very nice thing to do. There we are. Finally, the light in these paintings is quite interesting. So Diana and Actian, like most of the rest of the poesy paintings, has a light source coming from the left-hand side. Diana and Callisto is the only poesy painting that has light coming from the right-hand side, which would suggest that perhaps Titian was thinking that they would be hung side by side in between two windows, which is quite interesting because I don't really think that there's any way that Titian could have known where these were supposed to have been hung because at the time Philip II was travelling all over the place and had kind of no fixed abode, as it were. Anyway, the two paintings have remained together throughout their history, almost, if you recall, being shipped to England in the early 17th century and then passing into the collection of the Duke of Orléans in the early 18th century, where I am convinced that if paintings could speak, they would still be gossiping about the things that they witnessed during their time in the Duke of Orléans collection. The Duke of Orléans at this point was regent to Louis XV of France. Uh, so we're talking about 50, sorry, 1718, 17, 22, 23, somewhere in that period. And he lived in Paris in the Palais Royal where he was known to have had the most beautiful collection of artworks. He was also known to have been an extremely busy man. During the day, he would attend to affairs of state and in the evening, he would throw the most debauched parties. Guests would be invited, first of all, for supper, which they would take in the blue room, in the Salon Bleu, the room in which the Duke of Orléans hung his most erotic paintings. So I'm pretty sure that at some point the Diana paintings and also probably the Rape of Europa, which I'll talk about next time, would have been hung in the Blue Room. The parties were such that servants were barred from entering the room apart from perhaps to bring more champagne because the average per person was three bottles of champagne. Guests would then go off to the Palais Royal and watch perhaps a, a masked ball uh, where fortunately for them, if anyone got a little bit too amorous, just off the Regent's box was a bedroom 
quite extraordinary, isn't it? After the masked ball, they still weren't done. They would normally head back to the Palais Royal with perhaps some chorus girls who would perform a naked ballet. By all accounts, these soirees only broke up when everyone was so utterly drunk that they couldn't even communicate with each other anymore and they would be uh, sort of dragged off um, by footmen and put into to various carriages. So these were so wild, reportedly, that even Peter the Great, who was a renowned party-goer, refused a second invitation. So that's quite a departure from their time in the Spanish royal collection, when if it was known that the Queen was coming to visit, they would be hastily covered up by curtains. And by the way, these paintings also dodged a bullet in the form of the Duke of Orléans' son, who, unlike his father, was an incredibly pious and religious man and took exception to some of the more erotic works in the Duke of Orléans' collection. He even went as far as to take a couple of works, they were by the artist Correggio, and try and destroy them. So it's a minor miracle, really, that the Poesy paintings survived. But survive they did, and they were purchased by the nation in 2008, and so now spend their time between the National Galleries of Scotland and the National Gallery in London. So that's it about Diana and Callisto. Next time, we will be looking at the sixth and final of the Poesy paintings that Titian sent to Philip II. It's The Rape of Europa. Zeus is at it again, but this time he's disguised as a bull. I hope you'll join me. Bye. <laughs>